Hi everyone, I'm Dr. Calicia Clark. I'm a surgical oncologist and hepatobiliary surgeon at the Medical College of Wisconsin in Milwaukee, Wisconsin. And I'd love to talk to you today about making decisions and preparing for surgery after you've been diagnosed with a neuroendocrine tumor. So I always like to start off by talking a little bit about neuroendocrine tumors and why they're so special. Um, these are very rare tumors. They account for less than 1% of cancers diagnosed in the United States. And so that means that only about 12,000 patients are diagnosed per year in the US. The good news is that we have about 175,000 patients that are living with neuroendocrine tumors in the United States, which means that most of the patients that are diagnosed are gonna live long lives, even with this cancer diagnosis. The trouble with neuroendocrine tumors, however, is that because they're so rare, people don't always think about them. The reason the zebra is the animal of the neuroendocrine tumors is because typically when we hear hooves, we think of horses. But in the case of neuroendocrine tumors, we really have to think about something much more rare or special like a unicorn or a zebra. Um, and so physicians really have to have this in the back of their mind in order to prevent delays in diagnosis. Because the tumors are so rare, many surgeons and physicians have not seen or treated a neuroendocrine tumor. And so it's really important for you to find an expert, someone who has undergone some specialized training in neuroendocrine tumor uh, management, and they are familiar with how we diagnose and how we treat them. The outcomes are actually much better if you're treated at a center that sees patients regularly with this disease and treats patients regularly with this disease. So even though there may be some additional time or distance required for you to find the right team, that extra work up front makes a whole lot of difference on the back end in terms of how you're gonna do and how long you survive after your diagnosis. There's some other things that are unique about neuroendocrine tumors, and I'll talk a little bit about where in the body they're diagnosed. So these tumors arise from either nerve cells or cells that typically produce hormones in the body, and they can be anywhere throughout the GI tract, in the lung, or in other organs like the pancreas. So based on where your tumor is located, the surgeon that you see is going to be very different. They may have a totally different skill set. And so it's really important that you understand who you're seeing and why. So for example, if your neuroendocrine tumor is in the lung, the surgeon that you meet with may be a thoracic surgeon, but if your tumor is in the intestine or in the pancreas, very often you'll see a surgical oncologist. And in the pancreas especially, you have to know that that surgeon has expertise on pancreatic surgery, which is very different from just surgery of the GI tract. I think one of the things that's really hard for me is when I see a patient who shows up to my clinic and expects to have surgery the following day or the day after. And that really is a difficult situation to navigate because I have to explain to them why we have to spend some time doing a thorough workup. The workup is really important. We do a physical exam to check for lymph nodes that could tell us that the disease is more aggressive than we thought. Um, we also look for signs of whether or not the tumor is making hormones, and those things can be very evident on your physical exam. We also rely on lab tests, either from the blood, urine, and even sometimes the stool, to give us an indication about how much disease we have uh, present at the time of diagnosis, and whether or not those tumors are actually making hormones that can cause further clinical problems. Understanding how much disease a patient has and where that disease is located is really critical. And so we do rely very heavily on imaging tests like CT scans, PET scans, or dotatate scans that are specific to neuroendocrine tumors, and even MRIs of the abdomen and liver. Again, so we have a good idea of exactly where the tumor is and we can plan our surgery appropriately. Sometimes other procedures are required to find where the tumor is located. Um, for example, a colonoscopy may tell us if your tumor is in the rectum or even in the small bowel. A bronchoscopy or endoscopy can also give us an indication of where that primary tumor is. 
And oftentimes we do get samples of the tumor cells to tell us how quickly those cells are dividing and turning over. And that gives us an idea of whether or not we wanna start with surgery or if we wanna start with some other treatments. So the workup can be a little time intensive, but I always explain to patients that we really get one shot at doing your surgery right. And in order to do that, we have to dot all the I's and cross all the T's to make sure that we have a very thorough plan on how to manage your cancer. Why the workup matters matters because whether or not the tumor makes a hormone, in which case we consider those functional tumors, or if it's a non-functional tumor, the way we treat them may be vastly different. Most neuroendocrine tumors are non-functional, which means they don't secrete a hormone. And so they're often asymptomatic or associated with vague symptoms. And so patients will present at later disease states because of how long it takes for the symptoms to develop. So another part of the workup really is aimed at identifying whether or not the cancer is already spread to the lymph nodes or to any other organs, again, so that we can figure out exactly how extensive your surgery needs to be or if we need to treat with any additional medications before surgery. How long you live really depends on a few things. One is how quickly those cells are dividing and the extent of their disease. What that means is for patients that present with cancer that's confined to the area in which it started, those patients tend to do better. Their five-year survival is almost greater than 90% in all cases. But in patients that have lymph node disease or distant metastasis to the bones or the liver, the outcomes are much worse and additional treatments might be needed in order to maximize your survival. I think when you meet with a surgeon, one of the things that I always try to make clear to my patients, and I think every patient should understand, is what the goal of the surgery is. In many cases, the goal is a cure. A cure means that we want to remove all the tumor, we want to minimize any debility, we want to cure your symptoms, and this is very successful when we have localized neuroendocrine tumors, which means that the tumor is confined to where it all started. However, for patients that have distant metastasis to other organs, sometimes it's impossible to remove all of the tumor, in which case we sometimes discuss a debulking surgery. And debulking is a term that basically refers to trying to remove as much of the tumor as possible, but not being able to remove all of them. We do these surgeries because one, debulking can often offer some relief from your symptoms, especially in the case of functional tumors. It can also increase your ability to respond to treatments by reducing how many cells, the medications that you're gonna get systemically have to try to fight in order to prolong your life and to control your symptoms. But in general, debulking surgery is not a cure. And so I try to make it very clear when I meet with my patients what the goal is. Sometimes at the time of my initial evaluation, I get clues that this tumor might be a little bit more aggressive and that surgery may not be the first best step. I do this in the case of tumors that are very aggressive or tumors that are quite extensive and the morbidity of the surgery is gonna be high. In that case, we do what's called a new adjuvant approach where we treat the patient with some medications up front to either decrease the amount of tumor that's visible and to make the surgery safer and then we can proceed to surgery when we have a better chance of achieving either a curative operation or a good debulking surgery to provide some relief from symptoms and to extend life. I never talk about neuroendocrine tumors as purely just a surgical uh, treatment because there are other things that we use to, to control both symptoms and also to control the disease. And so some of the other therapies that we use include somatostatin analogs, things like octreotide or lanreotide. We do use some chemotherapies, especially for patients with more advanced or aggressive type of tumors. There are some targeted therapies that are new and are very effective for patients with neuroendocrine tumor, immunotherapies, and PRRT, peptide receptor radionucleotide therapy, those therapies are all excellent options for patients with advanced disease. 
And even in the setting of stage four disease, we can still extend life and maintain really good quality of life, especially if we're able to add surgery to some of these therapies. A common question I get is, well, what do I do between now and the time for my surgery? Well, I always tell patients that they have to focus on four main things. One is wellness. The burden of the diagnosis of cancer is, it's extreme for everyone. And it's very, very difficult to just get over sometimes the confusion and even the anger that's associated with the cancer diagnosis. No one deserves cancer and no one accepts it without a struggle. So really focusing on your wellness is important. Here at the Medical College of Wisconsin, we actually have clinical psychologists that works with all of our cancer patients. And they focus on things like insomnia, anxiety, how to disclose your diagnosis to close friends, relatives, or even children. And then trying to focus on exercises that can increase your overall mindset and wellness as you go through the process from diagnosis, treatment, surgery, and recovery. And so I can't underestimate how important that mind-body connection is. Everyone deserves the time and the opportunity to get well mentally to handle what's coming next. Exercise is also very, very important. The stronger you are going into surgery, the stronger you're going to be coming out of it. And so I usually recommend that patients do 20 to 30 minutes of cardiovascular exercise, whether that's simply walking 30 minutes consistently every day or eat running, biking, whatever gets your heart rate up for a prolonged period of time during that 30 minutes, that's gonna help you on the back end after you recover from surgery. I get a lot of questions about diets. And if you go on the internet, you're gonna find a lot of different diets that are anti-cancer diets. Um, we actually have a dietitian who meets with our patients and talks about this in detail. The diet for every patient is different. For patients that have pancreatic tumors, for example, if their pancreas is not able to make insulin normally, or if it's not able to absorb fats normally, then a special diet may be required to help to counteract the effects of the tumors in the pancreas. Similarly, if your tumor is in the GI tract, you may not be able to break down or digest high fiber foods. And so sometimes we'll limit the kinds of fibers that you eat. Overall, with the guidance of a good dietitian, most patients should just have a good, well-balanced diet. One that is high in healthy, lean proteins and really focuses on fruits and vegetables as a good source of healthy carbohydrates. And then you will need the support of your family and friends. This is not going to be a journey that you can do on your own. And leaning on people who love and care about you is really essential to getting through your surgery, recovering after it, and then continuing on in your wellness journey as you move to survivorship for neuroendocrine tumors. So in summary, neuroendocrine tumors are rare. Most physicians have not seen or treated this. And so you may have to seek care at a high volume center that may be a little bit further away from what you're used to traveling to see a physician. But the benefits of being treated by a team that has seen and managed this tumor multiple times and very regularly is usually better outcomes. And so it really is in your best interest to see an expert in neuroendocrine tumors. Your surgeon is a critical member of your team. I think all neuroendocrine tumor patients should be evaluated by a surgeon at the time of their diagnosis. The only person that can tell you that your disease is not resectable is a surgeon. And so I would really encourage all patients to seek a surgical consult in addition to a consultation with other cancer specialists to ensure that you're on the right plan for your tumor and your disease. Most of my patients live very long and healthy lives. And so I enjoy having a really long standing relationship with them. I follow my patients for at least 10 years after their diagnosis and surgery. And so we become friends and really we're just an extension of your support network. And then teamwork makes the dream work. Um, no surgeon or provider really 
can treat this disease in isolation. And so the utilization of your friends and family as your personal teamwork team, and then your physician family, whether that's surgeons, medical oncologists, dietitians, physical therapists, they're also a really critical part of your team. And together, our goal is to extend your life and to cure when we can.